So yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about caches. Um, quick, quick poll, I guess. Who thinks he's, so caches as in CPU caches, let me leave with that. Who thinks he's somewhat intimately familiar with caches? So I think that's one and a half, two, two and a half people, right? Um, okay, and then actually because we haven't really spoken about that, who feels like he's still more of a Rust beginner, just so I know. Okay, yeah, good. So that gives me some pointers to how much to talk about things. Um, okay, so to lead with, like everybody knows there are two hard problems in computer science, right? The first one is naming things, the second one is Kenshin validation, and the third one is of Boron House, obviously. Um, but what I actually want to talk about today is like three sections. So first I'll give you like a quick caches 101, just what is a CPU cache, what does it do, why is it there, whatever. Um, then I'm going to talk about caches and performance, what do you want to pay attention to, what do you need to do in order to actually get performed code of the whole thing. And then we'll look at some of the standard Rust data structures just to see um, how they perform with caches and which ones we want to use and maybe use for which use cases, right? So quick caches 101. Um, so modern computers, right? There's a problem. Access to RAM is relatively slow. And particularly it's relatively slow compared to how fast modern CPUs actually are. Like modern CPUs run at about four gigahertz and accessing like just one piece of data from the RAM is a lot slower than that. So a lot of the time, if we're just reading from random access memory, we're waiting for memory. We can't compute with that memory, right? So the solution that's been deployed since forever, basically, is we get caches in our CPU that store those, this data in smaller memory that's a lot closer to the actual CPU core, um, so we can access it faster and don't have to wait for RAM all the time. We still have to wait, usually, but we can get to the data a lot faster, right? Um, usually, caching is like done in two to three levels, so each level is further away from the core, and then the level closer to the core will read from the outer level. Um, some schematics pictures for that, just so you have seen it once. So you usually have like cores, let's say a four-core processor in this case. There are registers in that cores, um, which are obviously the things that's fastest to access. You can usually read from them in a single cycle compute with them, do everything, or less than a cycle even, depending on what implementation you have. Um, and then you have the level one cache, the yellow one cache, which is the closest to the core, which is, there's one of them for each core. And actually there's two of them for each core. Um, one for the instructions that you feed the CPU so that it can actually has an instruction stream that it can run, and the other one for data. And that's the fastest cache that you have, right? Closest to the CPU. Um, then there's an outer L2 cache, which is a bit bigger, which is significantly bigger already than the L1 cache. So you get more data in that, but it's a, a bit slower. So if data is already missing from your L1 cache, you might be lucky and it's still in your L2 cache and you get it from there instead of going back all the way to the RAM. And then again, one layer from that um, is the L3 cache, which usually, if it exists, doesn't always, but if it exists, usually spans all cores. So you have sort of shared caching between cores which is also kind of useful if you have threads that actually migrate between the cores so they don't, after migration, have to access RAM so that they can read from L3 cache, right? Um, and then beyond that, you obviously have RAM itself, which is the slowest in this picture. After that, in theory, there's um, swap space, like if you have your RAM full and all that kind of stuff. So in terms of how caches actually work, it's not as if they read each byte individually. If you get data from the RAM, it will always, or typically always, end up in caches, and it will end up in all caches up to the CPU. So if you read data, it is in L1, L2, and L3 cache. Um, and it's done in the granularity of what's called the cache line. So you can read a single byte or four byte at a time, but always what's called the cache line. Caches work in that granularity, so if you have to throw away data from a cache, all that data in the cache line will go away. Um, sizes of that are different between CPUs, obviously. Typical size today is something like 64 byte. Um, right. So cache invalidation, like the, the thing for our initial jokes. Um, so modern caches are what's called coherent. So you've seen like we have separate caches between separate cores, 
Um, so each core has its own L1 cache. But the thing is, if you read data from multiple cores and also write data from multiple cores, like the same data, obviously, um, you get problems with coherence if you're not doing anything special. Because then you'd write on one core, it would only end up in the L1 cache of that core. Like it's not necessarily going through to the memory. Another core might have the same data in its cache and it would read the old data because it didn't actually see the write. Even if the write was going to RAM, it would have old data cached from the read and would still read the old data. So what you have to do in order to get rid of that is um, implement some sort of what's called a cache coherency protocol and invalidate data that's in other cores, people's um, caches, right? So whoop. if anyone writes, it will have to invalidate that same data in everyone else's caches. And additionally to that, we have another reason that, like we have two other reasons that caches make drop data. One is obviously they're full. Um, so you're reading new data and the oldest or whatever algorithm you're using gets discarded. But also, interestingly enough, modern caches or at least on Intel systems are usually inclusive. And what that means is in order to have data in an L1 cache, it also has to be in all layers above that. So if you're dropping data from the L3 cache, because let's say core two is reading a lot of data and your L3 cache is full and you have to drop data from the, uh, yeah, from the L3 cache, um, and that data actually belonged to, let's say, core zero, then that data would have to be dropped from L2 and L1 cache for core zero, which is just an implementation detail and property of like inclusive caching, um, but also something to keep in mind. Like, even if you're working on something that fits comfortably in your L1 cache, something that another core is doing could potentially invalidate that data. Right, so. Some numbers for that, just to give you an idea. Um, L1 caches, this is on an Intel Skylake processor, so relatively recent i7, I think. Um, L1 cache is typically like 32 kibibyte in size. L2 cache is already 256 kibibyte in size. And L3 cache is like a whole eight megabyte. Um, but on the flip side, the further away from the CPU you get, the slower the whole thing gets. Like L1 cache is already like about one nanosecond. Um, L2 cache is about three nanoseconds to access, and L3 cache is about 10 nanoseconds. And once you get to RAM, it's a whole 16 nanoseconds. Which might um, seem relatively little, let's say. Um, but this is based on like a core running at four gigahertz, which means that in that case, the that L1 Access actually took four ticks, right? Because like one gigahertz would be one tick per nanosecond, and then four ticks is like, yeah, um, one nanosecond for four gigahertz core. So in theory, like assuming you can dispatch one instruction per cycle or per tick, you'd actually, even if data is just in the one cache, have to wait four ticks before you actually can do a computation. And like getting worse to the outer side. Um, yeah, quick last thing in the like 101 section, there's prefetching. So if you're reading linearly to data, either forwards or backwards, um, data is not fetched just when you actually access the data, but the processor also recognizes that, hey, someone is iterating forward through data, let me already fetch things that he'll probably access in the future. So while you're still doing calculations and not necessarily thinking about accessing the data, the processor will already have gotten it into cache so that you can access it then, uh, which is kind of a useful property. Okay, so now we learned a few things about the whole thing. Um, what does that mean for our performance? And the way I've done that is I have like a few, let's say, typical examples. Some are a bit more esoteric than classical use cases, just to get something that you could actually measure. Um, so I think this is a super classical one for this one, like matrix multiplication. So um, like the usual way you do matrix multiplication is, let's say this. Um, so you have a function, you give it two slices. What I've done in this case is this are two dimensional arrows, arrays. So the slice contains a set of arrays. Um, the arrays have all, the, all have the length of dimension and the slices, which you can't see from this, but they also all have the length of dimension. That's the theory behind that. Um, so and then the output is a vector. 
And what we're basically doing is we're allocating a new result vector for that and then iterating in rows and cells over the whole result vector with indexes. Um, and then we have that variable k to do like your usual matrix multiplication. So um, if you don't remember, like matrix multiplication is um, multiply the row by the column and then add that up. And that's what that does, right? A is indexed by the column with the second index over k, and B is indexed by the row, so with the first index. Um, what that means is practice that it goes linearly through A, so each element in A is accessed linearly, one after the other. It goes through B with huge jumps, where huge means dimension elements, right? Because it goes through the columns instead of through the rows. So the second element in that case will be one whole line behind that in memory. So different approach to that, um, store your data differently. So that's like the usually optimization you hear about. Make sure that matrices by which you multiply, which you might actually have like a fixed set of and you might use multiple times or stuff, don't store them in row major order, but store them in column major order. So that in memory you have the elements of a column next to each other instead of the elements of a row. So basically you transpose it once. Um, which, like the difference here in the, in the code is very, very minute. Like obviously it's just become the second index, which is K for B. Um, so this is again row by column, but assuming that B is transposed, right? And it turns out this is actually a lot faster. Like this is about nine times faster on the Core i7 mentioned there, which is actually this laptop. Um, so what we learned from that is CPUs, as I've already said, are very good at linear reads like due to prefetching, but also due to the fact that if you fetch one element, you'll have a whole cache line. So in our case, we had U32, so you fetch one element, you get 16 elements basically into cache and don't have to do RAM reads for 16 elements, right? And during those elements, you have the time to, again, do prefetching and fetch your next cache line and stuff like that. Um, the way you store data is important. Like you can always think about that, try to have data linearly in memory instead of with big gaps. And yeah, avoid skipping large chunks of data. Also note that um, what I've done is deliberately I've used those arrays. So if this was like a nested vector, I'd have a heap allocation, which basically contains pointers to a heap allocation, which means I will always have dimension elements directly adjacent, but then I might have a huge gap and then get the next dimension elements. So um, using arrays in cases like this is often helpful to actually get memory adjacent. Um, the reason specifically I chose a VEC at all, like you obviously could do a two-dimensional array, like just braces and then put dimension twice, um, is that I needed it in heap because the size at this point is so large that it doesn't actually fit on the stack and we don't have a good way yet to allocate actual arrays on the heap. So that's what that does. Basically, it's the easiest way to get away with do the other thing as a vector and the other thing as an array and you get a nice data layout in memory. Okay, different example, a bit different. Um, let's say you're, I don't know, writing a physics simulation, writing a game, you have a huge pool of objects and you're reusing those objects sometimes. Um, but a lot of the time, they are not live, so to speak, right? So you always store them, but you don't always need to do computation on them. So you put a nice is live tag as the first element of that object. Um, and then, as you can see on the right, would iterate through that list of objects and just check for you've drawn, is it live? Should I do computation on it? And if you do have to, do work. Um, so the interesting thing in this case is each of those objects is larger than the cache line. Like if we do the math, it's, let's assume one byte for the bool because Rust will helpfully automatically do reordering for us, so there won't be any padding. And then it's eight bytes for the ID, it's 24 bytes for the string, like pointer, length, and capacity, each U64, um, or U size technically, and then eight bytes for each of the F64. And I think that goes to be like 65 bytes or something like that. Um, so slightly larger, larger than a cache line on this particular system, but typically on many of them these days. So what we're doing is we're fetching like a cache line or maybe even two for the object and checking, let's assume the very first byte of it. And then we don't care about it anymore if it isn't live, 
And we do that like for each object. So basically, each object access, even if you're doing no computation on it at all, gives you a cache miss and you have to load a cache line. Um, so that's obviously bad. Um, as I said, data locality is important. Try not to skip large chunks of data in what you're reading, and the large chunk is basically everything after is live in this case. Um, so, but what do we do instead, right? So there are two things that you can typically do. One of them is have a separate vector just for that and like make sure the indexes line up. Um, that way you can iterate over the first vector which tells you liveness or whatever other information you might need, right? Information you iterate over often as opposed to some data that you just need rarely. Um, and then that will be cache efficient because everything is just one after the other and give you a nice speed up. The other way to do it is the conversion that is not too typical, I think, but seen relatively often in, in things like physics and high performance computing stuff, which is basically turning an array of structure into a structure of array. So where you have now a vector of objects, you would have the object type and for each field of the object type, you'd have a vector containing the elements. Um, in theory, compilers can do that automatically, but it's, let's say, rarely successful. And the main reason for that is basically that in order to be able to do that optimization, you have to be sure that nobody else is do, looking at that type. Because if you're changing the type, then the external interface obviously becomes different. So if the data is sufficiently private, compilers will actually, in some cases, do that optimization for you. Um, I'll, I'll just ask questions up to this point. Anything that I should talk about some more? Okay, so either everyone is dumb funded or I'm doing a decent job. Um, okay, so this, this one I have not actually a code example for, but just like a, as a general point. Um, code size matches. So if you have some hot code, like ideally, your code would fit into your L1 instruction in that case, cache, so it would be about 32 kilobyte. Um, of course, you can always do that, like depending on your algorithm, but if you have like a tight loop, you might consider trying to get all code that is run in that loop into that limit. Um, and like some effects of that are like calling a function that is already in cache might actually be cheaper than inlining that function and not doing function call. Like usually you'd say that um, Inlining is like always cheaper or whatever because function calls are relatively expensive but, and everything. But in particular, if it's code that's being repeated, it might be nicer to actually outline that code into a function if that makes it fit into cache and you don't get a cache miss every time that code is running due to like large amounts of code overall. Um, so if that's what's happening to you, you can try to annotate functions with inline never if you think that gives you a speed up. Also interesting is that um, generic functions, you'll get for each type argument you put into the generic function a copy of the function. Um, so that also blows up the size of code that's actually being executed at a time. And you can try to get rid of that to some extent by passing a trait object. I don't know if that's a trait object, a reference to a trait anyway. Um, never quite sure if we say trait objects just for box trait or also for reference trait. But basically, passing something that just implements a trait as a reference um, and do it that way, which also won't give you the code duplication. But for all of this device, very obviously measure. Like if you're optimizing hot code and you don't, you never, as a rule of thumb, you never know what's actually your problem. You can try all those things. You can try to see how big the code actually is. Um, and you can try some of this advice, but Always measure, always try to make sure if that helps or if that doesn't help. And if it doesn't help, don't do it. Or like in particular, things like inline never on like very small function can also significantly make things worse. So that's something to look out for. Okay. Um, so this is this is a code that I was referring to before that is like super synthetic. Um, that's nothing you will ever find like an actual code, but it's something that really nicely shows the phenomenon. Um, so what I'm doing here is basically I have a function that will increment elements of an array. Um, so I have this array x up there, which is like into an atomic reference counted, into the atomic reference counting type, so it can be shared among threads. And within that I have 
16 atomic U sizes. So atomic U size in this case, just for reference, is 8 byte because it's a 64 bit system. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm getting another reference to, so a reference count to the X array and passing it into this new thread. And within that thread, 100 million, I think, right? Yeah, 100 million times incrementing an element. Um, and outside the thread, so in my own thread, I'm also 100 million times incrementing another element. Um, the particular elements which I'm incrementing are like passed to the function as i and j, right? So sufficiently clear to everyone what that function actually does? Not or shake your head. Maybe. Hmm? Okay. Um, so basically, like, increment two different elements of an array a lot, right? Um, it turns out, like, incrementing adjacent elements in that array is a lot slower than incrementing elements that are, in this case, seven, eight, eight apart, right? Um, so, like, any, any, any takers for why that might be happening? Any ideas? Can you really have to invalidate the cache line if one thread? Uh... Yeah, so the, the, the answer was maybe yes to invalidate the cache line. Um, yeah, precisely. Like that's, that's actually the problem. Um, so what's happening here is that if we're having exactly adjacent elements, we're both writing on the same cache line, right? So one thread is writing to the first eight byte of the cache line, the other thread is writing to the next eight byte of the cache line. And as we said before, if writes to a cache line happen on a different core, then you'll have to invalidate it on all the other cores. So basically, for each add in which an add from the other core came in between, right, um, the cache line has to be refetched by the core. Um, so this is a phenomenon that's known as false sharing. Um, so basically, the necessity for this is just like one thread reads memory, the other thread writes near it, so as it, that it invalidates the cache line in the thread that's reading. Um, so typically, this occurs if values are on the same cache line, obviously, because otherwise you won't have this false sharing. Like, it will be different cache lines, and each one can really add independently on their own cache line. Um, access needs to be by different cores. Access needs to be somewhat frequent, let's say, because only, only then will it actually make a difference. So if, if cache is invalidated anyway between your writes, like by something else, but just using data, um, this won't matter, right? But if it's somewhat frequent and you actually invalidate it while someone else will have wanted to access it, that's a problem. Um, and there has obviously to be at least one writer, because if there are only reads, no cache line will ever be invalidated. I think this code actually might want to run just to show something. Um, so, oh great. Is that sufficiently large? Um, so this is just basically the, the function I've had on the slide, right? So increment stuff 100 million times. Um, and then down here, think I'll say some quick words about that. Um, it's basically how I benchmark that. So first thing, I actually run the function once without, um, without measuring anything. And the reason you'd want to do that if you're measuring anything related to cache is that otherwise it usually um, like messes up. Like you'll get cases where you're measuring two, in theory, different things. Um, and notice that the second one is always faster, even though maybe you even expected it to be slower. And in that case, usually the effect is that your cache is now warm, right? The first time it ran, everything was loaded into cache. The second time it ran, um, everything was already in cache, so it was a lot faster. And that also applies to different code, of course. So if you're doing another algorithm entirely, but on the same data, um, the second algorithm will always get positive effects from the first one running because that loaded data in the cache. So basically, I'm always warming up cache and then just using like Rust's instant interface, like very, very basic to um, get measurements. 
And um, yeah, I guess let's run that. So it takes a while, but actually not too long, I hope. Maybe I need power if it does. Right, so immediately adjacent entries in this case, more than five seconds, right? So a lot of time. And like entries that are eight entries apart, so not on the cache, same cache line, less than a second. So very, very noticeable effect of faults sharing like this. Um, as a way to actually like prove that that's what's happening, I can like force um, both threads to be on the same core, right? And if I do that, you'll notice that suddenly the adjacent entries, entries are a lot faster, but the spare entries have about the same timing. Um, and yeah, have about the same timing. So reason for that is obviously they are now using or sharing the same cache. Thanks for needing by you. Thanks. Um, OK, so let's get power real quick. So I do actually have a different example for, for false sharing, um, and it's a lot more real world. The problem is <laughs> it's not actually like I'm measuring the wrong thing, and I'll show you real quick. Um, so let's say source main. So this one is, is um, a different example, and actually like credit for this one goes to um, Oh, I forget the name. <laughs> like the basic thing you want to do is you want to count the number of odd elements in, an, in the matrix again, right? Um, and we we'll lose this thread. So basically, we get ourselves a result error like sufficiently large to um, be able to use it for different numbers of threads, and then we'll like iterate over the matrix, but chunked into elements. Um, like the number of lines divided by the number of threads, right? So each thread gets one chunk of the matrix, one chunk of rows. Um, and then each thread independently iterates across that row and counts elements that are odd. Um, the way we count elements in this case is like we are writing to one of the elements of our result vector, right? So first thread writes to element zero of the result vector, second thread writes to element one. So um, like obviously should be pretty classical case of false sharing too, right? They're writing to adjacent elements, they're different threads, they're in different cores supposedly. Um, so it gets a problem. So the way you'd fix that <laughs> typically is pretty obvious actually. Um, can I get them both on one screen? Well, sort of. Um, whoop, sorry. So the way you fix that is you introduce a local variable, right? So within the thread, you just have your own local variable, count on that. It's not in the array, not on the same cache line, not anything, um, and increment that, and it's just at the very end, write to the result vector once. Problem with this code is, as I said, it doesn't actually measure the right thing, because it turns out, and I've not sufficiently looked at the assembly, but it turns out even with a single thread, where this should not matter at all, like the whole false sharing thing, um, the one with the local variable is significantly faster. And like my guesstimate of why this one is always significantly faster is just that um, the variant without the local variable will always access memory, like always writes to the vector. But the one with the local variable can increment that variable in a register. So you're never like accessing memory at all, not even at one cache, not anything, right? So, um, yeah, I think that's, it, it, like, it's, it's bad that it doesn't show false sharing, like, bad for me. Um, I think it's an interesting lesson because what that shows is best thing to do about caching and accessing memory is don't access memory. Like, if you can do it in a single register for some time, then just access memory once when you actually really, really badly need to, do that. Have a small local variable, do it like that. Um, also interesting, I think. Okay, any, any questions about that, actually? Does your laptop uh, charge because the light is still on? I think the... <laughs> it claims to. It actually claims to. The light on the back side is still on. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if it doesn't... It's blinking. Uh, let me see. Maybe. 
Probably not. But like, I, I make do with 10 minutes or whatever I have, I, I hope. Um, any non-charging related questions? <laughs> okay, so um, I thought I'd just do a quick, quick rundown of like typical Rust data structures, like not a lot of them, a few of them. Um, so vector, vector is obviously like from a cache point of view, amazing. Because vector is like one contiguous data structure in heap memory, no gaps, no nothing. You can iterate through it pretty fast. As I said, linear reads are what CPUs are graded at, if you want to read through that, forwards or backwards. You're good from a cache perspective, that's nice. Um, and turns out they're so good for caches that they often outperform other data structures. That's a discipline that those other data structures are specifically designed for, at least up to a certain number of elements. Um, just because cache often like trumps everything. Like if the other data structure for some reason has to use the separate nodes that are a part in memory and just not very, um, very sparse, eh, very, very tight together, um, you'll, you'll get negative effects from that and everything being in L1 cache as it usually is for elements and vectors, it's just, it's just nice for that. Um, so linked lists, linked lists is almost only in here because if that talk was done in another language, someone would tell you about linked lists. Because, show, show of hands, who has ever used linked list in Rust? <laughs> right. Um, and it turns out I've never seen anyone use linked list in Rust, actually. But it exists. It's in the standard library, right? It has, has always been SD collections linked list. Um, it's there. So, linked lists are not so great for caches. And that's usually why they're like the, the example of don't do this. Um, linked lists have one heap allocation per node, like you have those separate nodes per element, right? And they have one pointer to the previous element, one pointer to the next element, and the actual data. Each of them is a separate heap allocation. And those heap allocations are not necessarily like contiguous. Like unless you're allocating them like in terms of time closely to each other, they're very likely to be spread apart across your heap, right? And even if that's not the case, the heap will usually like look for bins that are pretty close to the size you're actually allocating, so they might still be spread even if you're allocating them just back to back. Um, so iteration is pretty expensive. Like you're chasing, as I say, the next pointers through the list of linked lists, and you are likely to get one cache miss per element, right? Because you're chasing across the cache. Um, so and then again, the point I'd usually be making at that point is. Um, Insertion on linked lists is terrible and stuff. Like, you might have been told in university that linked lists are great for insertion because insertion is very cheap. You just like change two pointers, but actually you'll also have to walk the list up to the point where you want to insert, and then you get the super slow walk. And actually, vectors are like cheaper up to a few thousand elements and blah. Turns out Rust can't insert of the middle of a linked list. <laughs> um, that, that function just straight up does not exist. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's nice, I guess. <laughs> what, what does exist is we have an append function, so you can link two linked lists together, which is obviously super cheap, like again, changing two pointers. But you actually, because we have a pointer to the very back of the list, you don't have to run across it or anything. So that's like legitimately cheap and legitimately a lot cheaper than chaining together two vectors, right? Um, What's also relatively cheap is pushing to the front or the back of the list. Um, and particularly to the back, it's again very, very likely to be slower than pushing to the back of a vector. Because for the list, you'll have to do the heap allocation for the new node. For the vector, you probably already have the heap allocation for that element because vectors like, have a capacity separate to their lengths and that grows in powers of two. So you only really rarely actually reallocate memory for vectors. Um, push front actually doesn't exist for vectors, interestingly enough. If you actually need push front and push back on a data structure, um, use vecdeck. So that's your trick to basically get the push front. Vecdeck is like the underlying data structure is a vector, so vectors, right? Um, and it's one contiguous heap allocation, all things like that. And it's basically a global ring buffer, right? So it get, goes across the, the last element of the vector and back out the front. Um, and whenever that ring buffer becomes too small, so every element is full, it will actually like double in size, like a vector would for memory allocations. 
and you have a larger ring buffer, yay. Um, and that way you actually have like super cheap push front and push back on that one too. Um, and they're vector cheap and not linked list cheap. Like you're not doing a heap allocation and putting a pointer to that heap allocation, but you're actually like writing two space in a vector and you're done and like changing two indexes because it's a ring buffer. Um, so that's pretty nice about that. Right, did I forget something? I feel like I forgot something. Ah, that's good. Um, so hash map, another data structure that's like kind of interesting, kind of used a lot. Um, and hash maps actually happen to be pretty good in Rust in terms of people seem to be, let's say, a bit pissed off about C++'s, well, what is it? Unit map, I think, right? Is that the equivalent? C++ programmers? Yeah, as, yeah, STD map is the one that people agree on is shitty anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, unordered map, yes, right. Brain is working, okay. Um, so you have STD map and you have STD unordered map and STD unordered map is pretty much what, it's equivalent to our hash map, let's say. Because map also needs to keep up some ordering properties, I guess, in terms of insertion order whatever. I'm not actually sure. Um, so it turns out the interface that C++ programs and everyone gets is apparently done in a way that only really works if your hash map is implemented one specific way. And one specific way in this case means like the implementation you probably heard about in university, let's assume, um, which would be you do a hash and that hash gives you an entry in a list and that entry in a list itself is a list. So for everything that hashes to the same value, you have like a linked list of elements, which are all the things you don't want about linked lists, right? Um, and the other thing you like get to do is put them all in a long vector, like all of the elements. And then if you notice that that element is already taken, you have basically two um, cases of what to do. Either you do linear probing, so look at the next element and then at the next element, or just jump ahead for some time and hope that there's nothing there. Um, the one being better for caches, obviously, is linear probing, because as I said, elements next to each other in the same cache line, great. Um, and Rust actually does linear probing, so that's pretty cool. Um, linear probing with Robin Hood bucket stealing in particular, as the documentation will tell you, and there have been tons of blog posts written about Rust hash maps and why that's amazing that we use that algorithm and how fast it is and how cache efficient and whatever. Um, so if you care deeply about that, you might want to look up one of those. Um, in any case, yes, cool, much better than other languages. Not necessarily, like just because it's a hash map, it's not as good as a vector in terms of like doing things, but it also does a completely different things, right? So it does key value lookup and vectors just store linear data. Um, so probably I should make the point here that what I said about vectors holds, like if you have really few elements, um, it might actually be faster to just iterate over the whole vector and compare the key of each element might happen, just because that fits into cache way better. But obviously, like, the cutoff point is not, not super obvious there. Um, last one, I think, B-tree map, also interesting data structure, I think. Basically a binary tree, so same thing as a hash map, but you need to have orderable and, I think, comparable. Yeah, orderable, orderable values. Um, also, there the documentation will tell you nice things about how this is better than the regular binary tree. Um, and probably also there, there are plenty of blog posts. Um, basic idea is like instead of doing the usual binary tree where you allocate a node for each tree element, right? And again, would get that pointed chasing kind of thing. Um, each allocated node as a memory actually contains multiple elements. And then from each of those nodes, you link to multiple, again, elements which contain multiple elements. So to some extent you have um, subtrees in just a regular vector. So again, making it a lot better for cache efficiency than like you usually beat binary tree would be. Okay, um, super quick summary. So caches are good at two things, which is temporal locality. So accessing the same thing often in about the, at about the same time and spatial locality, accessing things that are close to each other, right? For aforementioned reasons. So try to do that as often as you can. 
Um, try to keep your working set small, those, the, the data that you're working on, both in terms of instructions and memory, if you need to be fast, so particularly in hot loops, obviously, because that's what you want to optimize. Um, and use VEC, like if in doubt, use VEC. And second to that, maybe use VEC DEC if you need a push front for whatever reason. Okay, that's it uh, from me, if you have any questions. Um, what about memory alignment regarding the uh, cache? 60, uh, 64 bytes. Um, I, I strongly believe they have to be aligned, and I don't know if Rust is able to express uh, some alignment in the memory. Good question, actually. I've, I'm also not sure. Um, I think there might now be an align attribute. I couldn't tell you for what, though. Like, there are technically multiple places where having an align attribute would say, make sense, right? It would make sense on actual data type definitions. So you could, let's say, define your um, vector like in, as an SIMD vector type and make sure that's always aligned to 128 byte or whatever the requirement there is. Bit probably is a 16 byte align, something like that. Um, and then whenever that type is used, use that alignment and it would make sense on separate variables if you have just a very generic type like an array but you have a use case in mind that needs a certain alignment. Um, I think at least the former one has an attribute, might be nightly only, but I can't really comment on that. Um, but certainly space to be filled, yes. How to insert elements in the middle? Of what? <laughs> of anything, of any anything. data structure. Um, I, think, I think part of the answer is just do. Um, like coming, coming back to the point of when the, where we usually would talk about insertion in linked lists, right, is, as I said, they are not as good as you think you are anyway because you have to walk the linked list, but also they are surprisingly inefficient compared to vectors. Like things CPUs are also apparently very good at and not surprisingly seeing how vector instructions and everything are available nowadays is shifting data around. So I haven't done the benchmark myself and I have forgotten the actual numbers, but people compared like linked lists and inserting in the middle to inserting in the middle of a vector which obviously needs you to copy the whole bunch of trailing memory over, right? Um, and it was surprisingly late that linked lists were actually faster. Like few few thousand, if not 100,000 elements or something like that for I think typical 32-bit integers or whatever. Um, so yeah, just do and don't expect it to be slow just because you feel like shifting it around should be slow is I think part of that answer. Um, the other answer is just use the insert function where it exists. Apparently it doesn't exist for, for data structures where it's inherently slow. Interestingly enough, like, I feel like Rust guides you pretty well in terms of what you should be doing with the type. Like if you tried to use push front on a vec, you'd see there's no push front. And then let's say you go to the Rust RC channel and say like, hey, why is it push front? What the fuck? And people will tell you, use vec deck. It basically does the same thing as a vector, but it has a push front and the push front will be a lot faster than it could be on the vector, right? So I feel like Rust is guiding you to some extent with, with the operations that are actually available. Are there any good um, performance measurement tools for Rust like VTune for C++? I don't know VTune. VTune is like performance counter reading and everything. Yes, right? something yeah. like cache grind for right. um, Linux. Honest answer, I don't know. Like, really, really wide answer is the same that work for C++ often work for Rust. Like, particularly in like the Linux space and open source space, if it reads dwarf debug info, there's no inherent reason that it wouldn't work as well for C++ as it does for Rust. 
um, like you should be able to get the sample counts for performance counter matched up to an address anyway, like that's what they do. And that matching that address based on dwarf inference to source line is this, the same thing for C++ and Rust. So in theory, cache grind and all those stuff work just as well. I have one more question in regard to enums. In regard to what? Enums, enumeration enums. types. Okay. Because some piece of advice that is often floating around is that to keep enum variants of this, uh, basically the same size. Mm -hmm. For example, you have like a typical result and your okay value is, I don't know, a string. And your error type is a custom enum that is using some variants that are very much larger than 24 bytes. So mm -hmm. this is bad. Do you have some kind of advice in that regard or some experience in uh, at which point it's better to use uh, like the heap allocation and box type? instead of an inline type for that? I think, in general, that would depend on your use case, like the, the point at which that makes sense to do, right? Um, but I think the observation is sound. Like, you're obviously wasting, like wasting a lot of potential cache space if you have large variants in the enum, which may not matter if those are the variants that you use often. For the result type, the specific argument that I've heard people make is that like your good case and your case that almost always happens is you get the okay variant. And then if you do, if you, of course, if you do things like map over something that returns a lot of results, um, and in theory, all of them are like U8 and one byte large, but the error type is like 20 bytes or whatever. That means you have to access 20 bytes of enum in theory um, each time you, you access one of those results and have much larger gaps in between. Um, so if you have those cases, which you have, let's say, fairly often, because as I said, okay, should be the case that almost always happens unless you have like special code. Um, it probably makes sense to use box instead. And then the point at which that makes sense probably depends on a lot of factors. Like if errors still happen somewhat frequently, that heap allocation might ruin your performance. Um, if the error type is not that much larger, it might just not be worth it, and things like that. But like, probably, as always, some advice for that is measure. Right. Sounds advice. Any more questions? OK. Thanks for your talk. So I'm a newbie to Rust. So my question is, is there some special trick that you can do in Rust that you cannot do in another language? So for example, um, a good uh, example is this inline case where you say uh, sometimes it's better to inline and another time it's better not to inline. And uh, yeah, could, could, could the language help you with this? Maybe you could say inline, only short stuff, or is, what, what kind of uh, things can the language do to this? Good question. Um, I think just having the inline attribute upon itself is already something you could mention as the language can do that, right? Like if you can give it hints, standard C and C++ certainly don't allow that. There are probably GCC extensions for that though. Um, and probably MSVC extensions as well. <sighs> Other than that, good question. Um, I think... Hmm? Struct layout. Right. So something I've, I've like mentioned in passing is um, what will help you to keep data small is like lay out your struct appropriately. Well, that's the C advice for that, right? Because in C, your structs always will have the same order as you write out the fields. So if you do things like put an 8-bit integer first and then a 32-bit integer, you'll have to have three bytes of padding between that, right? which is space that you're potentially wasting. If you put the eight byte integer, one byte integer at the very end, um, it would 
not necessarily waste all three bytes. That's actually a terrible example because it's still for alignment reasons, but if as soon as you have like two of those one byte integers, that would help. Um, that's something that Rust does automatically. Like from the beginning, we have said that struct memory representation is undefined in that way. Like fields can be reordered by the language. And by now they are, like this has been implemented within I think the last year or something like that. So that helps because it just keeps data smaller than they would be in other languages and you can still like write fields in the order that feels semantically meaningful to you. Um, good point. Uh, things that can help that come to mind, not necessarily specific to the language, but having things like actually um, development or debug output for how large functions also are actually got in terms of code size during or after compilation, stuff like that. Um, I do think some of those things are implemented or have been proposed for the Rust compiler. I'm not sure what the state of they, them is actually. Um, but yeah, it's, that's the smallest that, that comes to mind immediately. There was a blog post recently about some people optimizing uh, JavaScript source map parsing by re-implementing it in Rust and compiling it to WebAssembly. As you can probably tell from this title, it's not that related to caching, but uh, <laughs> because there's like just a time compiler and a whole other language runtime between. Uh, but one interesting optimization they were able, able to do was to use trait objects or monomorphized traits uh, very easily. Like what Florian recent, uh, a few slides ago showed was using trait objects, that is not using generics but using uh, a reference to a trait. And that is all the change you need to do to switch between these representations. So in, in some cases it's, it's possible for the compiler to generate a very specific version of a function for a generic parameter and inline this and basically optimize it down to a very tight loop because it knows this type. But in other cases, it's not possible and the compiler will generate a huge bunch of code for each of these functions. And in this case, it's much, more easy, uh, much, much easier to uh, reduce the code size by using a trait object. And this is quite easy in Rust and it's not possible or much harder in other languages. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the attention, I guess.